Hello there, everyone, and welcome back to TNO, you know, the last series of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. <clears throat> Sislav Lover. And right now, we're doing a Rafal on the party, because that's always a good thing to do. That's all for the party, my friends. It's clear that our task is to rebuild the Soviet Union in a more perfect form. In order to reflect our renewed purpose, we shall disband the Communist Party of Komi and rebuild the Bolshevik All Union Communist Party. The VKPP will return to the forefront of our politics as we prepare to expand, and it will be the political vanguard of our desire to reunite Russia under the flag of Lenin. On the first Reform Congress of the KPSS, the first Congress of the Reform, the VKPB, will be the place where we decide the political direction that will take in the reconstruction of the Soviet Union. All most prominent members, and of course our leader, will take turns in explaining their beliefs and try to convince the Assembly to adopt their proposed resolution. This is a great opportunity to set a doctrine in stone, and what we decide today will echo in the halls of Moscow when we return there in triumph. Long live the Soviet Union, long live communism, and long live Lenin. As right now, as you can see, we're beating the crap out of the Finns, which they totally deserve right now because they are uh, evil. The Finns are not great. A call to order. Meetings of the Communist Party headquarters rarely took so long to get started in the days of the Communist Republic. This order frequently ruled as a jocular Zidanev had allowed idle chatter to continue past the scheduled starting point. Mikhail Soslov was far more intolerant of wasted time, and once the clock struck two, any private conversations quickly faded under his icy stare before he began to speak. This meeting is called to order. The first order of business is a discussion of the government's future prospects. While we have achieved much in the past months, our work is far from over. We have achieved victory over the splitters and the fascists and reasserted ourselves as a preeminent power west of the Urals. However, if we are to reclaim the rightful borders of the Soviet Union, we must firmly establish ourselves as a government that is efficient, stable, and strong, the opposite of the Vaznesensky regime. To this end, I have prepared a series of proposals that will enable us to assert state control while presenting the Russian people with a better life than the one they experienced under the bandits and collaborators who occupy their homes. This, Once this is accomplished, we must maneuver east and reclaim the lost resources and industry of Siberia. We will now have a report from Comrade Vernakov on the state of the military. Following that, the floor will be open for discussion. The Shadow Master has entered the spotlight. Do we have any upgrades here? No, Fortress Buster's not bad. Do you have any upgrades? No, that sucks too. And also, are mobilizing more? Well, we're demobilizing. Okay. Do we automatically go down to two-year draft um uh, yeah we do earlier like when i set this up to play as comey i, we, I always usually go four-year draft so it's weird that we force to go down a two-year draft but whatever collective rule uh libertarian socialism goes down i won't do this one because we want to reduce uh administrative strain Many misinformed people consider the Soviet Union and communism as a whole as a dictatorial government akin to national daddyism. This is nothing but a lie in its truest form. Communism is collective rule, made by the people and for the people. We have nothing in common with tyrants but be they monarchs or dictators, in order to reassure all, both inside and outside Komi, that we, what we support is not dictatorial rule, but democracy in its truest form we shall set this in stone, that our ultimate goal is to create a government where everyone has a say. Whatever decision needs to be taken, the people and elected institutions shall vote, and the majority opinion will be followed by all, such as democratic central the true way to social justice. And who does not love social justice? Well, we can't win down here. And we have 12,000 calories versus 48,000. Um, with the Finns, they're almost out of manpower, so I'm kind of okay with what's going on ish, sort of. I want you to go. Go. Go to Ulu. Just take all the territory that you possibly can right now. Because overall, we're winning. Not down here, not so much, but up here, generally, yeah, we are. So, actually, go up here. If you can encircle these guys, it'd be great. And I'll grab some more output too. That'll be awesome. We don't have a lot of divisions, but you know what we have is not bad. Sports robbery going here, but that was good head. Hey. Go in here first. Do not get encircled for the love of God. Nice. Kill them off. Kill them off. Come on. Uh, we got both divisions. Nice. Okay. Woo. 76,000. 20,000 for us. That's fine. Whatever. Whatever. They've got to be out of manpower now, right? I will kill off all the fins if we have to. Nice. <laughs> According to plan, the All Union Communist Party's first Congress was just as illustrious and suspicious as Suslov had envisioned. A delegate was entered to the applause of crowds. The speeches were read off exactly as written, all proceeded according to plan without a single hand of revisionism or deviation of truth. It was slightly boring. The old days had plenty of plots, plenty of excitement, plenty of chaos. No, he prefers this better. As it then briefly brought him out of reminiscence, he went back to eyeing the delegates and taking notes. One sp spoke loudly. Perfect spokesman. 
The two others stood at each other's side, a practically identical appearance, though one pandered to the crowd, and the other remained silent, watching everyone around him like a hawk brother included. All these men have been selected for this very moment. All of them played their part as though Mikhail was personally pulling the strings. He barely spoke aside from the small correction or a single statement, simply observing as the Congress churned along a well-oiled machine that provided a shining example of how future Congresses should be concluded or conducted. Though there was much work to be done, it has all led to this the precedent of consensus. The need for decisiveness. Ooh! Ooh, I want to get rid of this train, though. Hmm... The precedent of consensus. What democratic essentialism at its core means that the majority rules. This principle must be tempered in the doctrine of Bolshevism, <clears throat> which teaches us that the people must always have their say. We can't claim to be the true pursuers of justice if we show disdain for the opinion of the people and its demo democratically chosen institutions. To this end, all decisions taken by the government will be strengthened by a qualified majority of the elective body. It might make our path a bit longer, our pace a bit slower, but we are carrying the freedom of the Soviet people. Such a big, beautiful, fragile thing must be held with all due care, lest it breaks forever, or the need for decisiveness. The people must always have their say in matters of the government. However, there are situations in which an expert government sees farther than those it represents. Even good-willed people may rash, act rashly or with poor foresight in order to put a remedy to such mistakes. Even if it made in good faith, the government must be able to overrule the elected body. To the same, the General Secretary will have the power to veto any decision taken by the Presidium. In order to show a commitment to democracy, the Presidium will be able to overrule the Secretary's veto with a qualified majority of two-thirds of its votes. We march the glory for the Soviet Union. Ah, I, like, I like reducing administrative strain. Yeah, for this one, I think we'll do that one. Why not? Sounds like a good idea. My voice continues to crack for some reason. Oh boy. My cow are high, but we're getting a lot of army XP. So, like, I know this is not a great way to do it. But we just encircled them all, so... A creeping fear. And yet, yeah, Soslav found himself deep in the thoughts. As he re recollected the events of the past few weeks, a creeping feeling of fear keeping him awake in the late evening. Though the party came into power, Mikhail still found himself dubitative dubiative on the topic of unity and loyalty within the party. His fears of factionalism and worse revisionist tendencies that some members may hold. Some undermined his might undermine his efforts to preserve an image of strong party unity. One can look at this face and see nothing but a stern man. Unmovable, impassive, but Soslov remained human in spite of it, the image he tried to uphold. One that he couldn't help but find himself wondering if its efforts in bringing the Soviet Union, one run being run by democratic collective rule, will ever prove successful or fail, fail like so many others before of no, for note in history. Only time will tell. And let's just be real here. Yeah, we're going to be successful. Ah. One, two, three. Six divisions here. Good. Kill them all. You will win here. There you go. Actually, take all you guys. Come back to the front over here. There you go. And now we're definitely going to win because they have up to 10 divisions max. And we have a cup of coffee here to keep us nice and warm too. I formed the ASSRs. In the old times, ethnic minorities within the Soviet Union were organized into autonomous Soviet socialist republics. There they could contribute in their unique way to the advancement of the socialist cause. Safe in the knowledge of their tongue, their traditions, and their way of life would not be threatened to be, to be swallowed by the Russian majority. With the collapse of the Union, of course the ASSRs were abolished, but this doesn't prevent us from reestablishing them. At least on theoretical grounds, should we ever be able to incorporate lands held by the old minorities in our bid to reclaim Russia, they will, be, they will return to the, our old system, granting stability and legitimacy to our rule. Nice. Yeah, and these guys are done. They're absolutely done. Nice. Uh, nope. Absolutely not. After you start losing, nope. We're going to go all the flipping way, man. All the way. We're going to need a lot more equipment and uh, spending, so... Where we're headed, spending is not an issue. A uh, new Soviet woman. Proclaim social equality. Address official standards. Competence is a rare quality in these troubled times all around us and sometimes even among us. Lurk, corrupt, inefficient, disloyal officers who pursue their own goal by the nation who are simply too stubborn or proud to admit that they are utterly unable to serve the nation as it deserves to be. If we're to be a beacon for the beleaguered peoples of Russia... <coughs> Then we need to excel in all things, including the difficult art of administration. We must choose the best for the bureaucracy and institute laws and organs that will punish the corrupt and the incompetent as harshly as it is needed for the good of all. <clears throat> Excuse me, my voice. Oh boy. Oh boy. <clears throat> These guys want to come out. That's fine with us. Ah, unconditional surrender. 
<clears throat> Ooh, wunderbar. Well, we lost how many? 30,000? 34,000? That's not bad. We're killing 144,000 of them. Hold on. 163,000? It's not enough. But we did it, my friends. We did it. You continue hunting the opposition, but nah, we're good. I don't mind fighting these guys. But we do get some more consumer goods. I want more output, though. Here to that one. Screw you, a Finn, a Lin. Nice. Reform the ASSRs. Recognizing the need for the degrees of national determination for ethnicities living within our borders, a cadre of communist bureaucrats have approached the government with plans to establish a new Tata ASSR, providing greater representation, autonomy, and identity for the Tatas loyal to the regime. We are urged to believe that this foreign or sovereign autonomy can help us better govern the various regions now under our administration. The proposal was presented to the Politburo, receiving various different reactions from members. However, with a general consensus of approval, the council has agreed to permit the establishment of the new Tata ASSR and it, as an autonomous republic within our borders and subordinate to subordinate to the central government. Subordinate to the Soviets. It appears that the Soviets, the basic economic unit, and the very namesake of the Soviet Union, has been getting ahead of themselves as of late. They already like the Supreme Soviet and the Presidium and the other duties assigned to them by the law, but they still want more influence over governmental affairs. This is where it ends. Adherence to the law is what we defines the Soviet man, not thirst for power. We shall make it clear that the Soviets already have their powers and duties, that, and that ex exceeding the mandate of the law is a crime. A very serious and crime indeed. <clears throat> and they'll probably do a commitment to socialism. A commitment to the, par to the party. As the vanguard of socialism and communism into the world, the party is the very embodiment of the socialist doctrine and purpose. Our government was elected thanks to the efforts of the party, and from it comes our most important and competent advisors and ministers. Denying such a simple truth is akin to madness. In order to show granted to the party, the government will make sure to consult it often, and party officials and bureaucrats will receive several additional duties within the government, so that they may integrate even more perfectly our state with our party doctrine. <clears throat> and I apologize for my coughing. I, uh, I usually don't have this issue, but my bad. My bad. Don't mean to. Well, we just have a lot to do here. Look at all this building we can do. All these civvies. We could get some more millies, but I don't want the debt to be blowing up too much. We're going to have enough debt as it is. Whether it's real life or in game, we'll be fine. So that costs us quite a bit of artillery, which sucks. But whatever. We need more arty. We actually have a few planes, too. For now. Because our guys are 40 combo. That's why we don't have a lot of uh, soldiers. And I did rush out before this episode started. Um, some. Like half the army. <laughs> so. If you didn't know. A commitment to the party. Unity in purpose, unity in ideology, uh, uplift social culture. Socialism is much more than merely a political ideology. It's a culture set of values to use every day. We can say, even say that socialism is a way of life and the perfect, and the per most perfect in the world. In socialism, the workers work as much as the nation demands and they receive everything they need to make their lives meaningful and worth living. With a renewed emphasis on our socialist roots, we should make sure that everyone understands that socialism is something that permeates their entire lives, not just the electoral urn. To this end, we'll enact a propaganda campaign aimed at exalting socialist values and their contribution to society. Not a bad idea. Tea time. Quiet chatter occupied the dimly lit restaurant, sunlight only barely peeking through the blinds of the windows. The wooden floors creaked under the pressure of the waitstaff, dodging patrons and employees alike as the mid-afternoon rush began. There you go. The waitress sat down eight cups of tea on the table, plucking one off her tray after the other. The comrade in the suit uh, reached first, then the suited command, or comrade, then the comrade who wore a suit. <clears throat> the cliques sipped at their tea. Quite good, they said, or at least one said. Quite, said the other, stirring the drink, silence was at the table. Uh, one eventually disturbed the stillness. Quite good indeed, not too unlike the direction of the party. The table nodded in agreement. My tea is bitter, piped up one member of the table. It tastes old. The table responded with a chorus of affirmation. The consensus was clear. The tea was old. Shall I call the waitress some? No, no, no. The owner doesn't care for complaints. He'd have us removed. The tea. The table murmured in agreement. So they grumbled, but they still sipped their tea. Well, maybe once their owner passes, we'll try again. A new Soviet woman. Um, do we want that one? Our fair half. Hmm... Claim social equality. I kind of like that one. That one's kind of feels like 
decisive, or proclaim social equality. Like Hammer and Sickle, man and woman are fundamental to socialism, each with their own role, or proclaim the freedom of all workers from the shackles imposed by capitalism and moralism, and the role of women will no longer be that of a glorified, glorified cook and babysitter, and baby maker. At the same time, we understand that man and woman must have each of their own peculiarities. Equality must be tempered by the laws of nature, and while a woman will never be forced to assume a role she doesn't want, we should still incentivize all to follow the path evolution has set. Hmm, yeah, keep boosting it up because we need more output. The war against Omsk is going to be probably pretty darn difficult. The problem at hand. What problem are you referring to, General Secretary? Poman Maryov shifted in his seat, even after years of cooperation, so Slav always had made him uneasy. The eyes had never wavered from the person he was speaking to, holding the blank expression at from everyone from his closest friend to his worst enemy received. The impeccable state of dress that he always maintained, even amidst the chaos of the Komi Republic. Or perhaps it was simply the manner in which he carried himself, cocksure and poised even at the most unimportant times. The problem of the Progressives, Premier. They've been ceaselessly pushing for us to enact their reforms, claiming that the state has a responsibility to promote the welfare of neglected citizens. This would be an inconvenience in peacetime. It is exceptionally dangerous at a time when the Union is surrounded by potential enemies. And what do you require from me, General Secretary? Ponomaro uh, had long known to listen, who to listen to. Sosov's machinations were precise and robust, and playing your part in them was a wise decision. I want you to... <clears throat> Given to their demands, they must believe we have addressed their concerns, extol the values of progressivism, and specify how we reach those values and aims. This will be our goal until the problem goes away or until we have to adapt. I'll prepare a speech immediately. Of course, your concerns are being addressed, of course. But encourage the people. Unlike the autocracies or the false democracies, the Soviet Union is made firstly by its workers and citizens. We are the only ones who truly let the common man and woman participate. Uh, to the government or in the government, and it's extremely important for the health of our political system that uh, as many possible take interest in politics. The socialist revolution and the class struggle are permanent features of our life as long as a single nation on earth is still ruled by bourgeois, the bourgeois, and all loyal Soviet citizens should fulfill their duty to the cause of Lenin, be it in the factory, on the field of battle, or in the halls of presidium. Achievement of social equality. The bolded headline marched proudly across the paper, and Katya's eyes followed it in confusion. Vanya, I, <clears throat> I don't understand. What does this mean? It says right there, The Soviet Republic of Western Russia is pleased to announce that since the order of Comrade Sosov to investigate and rectify the unsuitable status of women within the nation, we have found in all aspects of life, we have achieved complete equality between the sexes. Unlike the bourgeoisie capitalists and the press of fascists who value women only as homemakers and broodmares, socialist societies advance to a point where women serve an equal position to men. Our investigations found it this to hold true from the factories of Gorky to the fields of Bashkortostan. Isn't this what you've been advocating since the days of Osnesinski? So thanks to this proclamation, my neighbor stopped beating his wife when dinner's not to his satisfaction, and that when women are sent to the factory when they're treated properly by the men who tell them what to do, what do you think this actually does? It allows us to focus on restoring the union, Katya. The parties allowed women to work in the place of men to strengthen us, and you're giving me this historical anti-state lecture. You're hopeless, Vanya. She shoved the paper back into his hands and stormed off, leaving behind a very confused man. What could have made her so upset? <clears throat> you try to give them stuff, and then they end up being upset at you. Unity and purpose. The old union was plagued by infighting, and political deviance was regarded as religious heresy, and many were burned to the stake, some even literally, for a slight deviation from party doctrine. If we want a new, new union to stand the test of time, we need to unite rather than divide, and convince rather than force. We won't make the same mistakes as our predecessors. We can't afford it right now. <coughs> to this end, we'll accept all those who truly believe in the socialist cause, no matter the sh their shade of red. In difficult times, we need all the friends we need. So, as long as they learn the true ways of Marxist orthodoxy in time, <clears throat> Very good. And we want to make sure our poverty gets better and better and better. And of course the economy as well, but that's kind of plays into it as well. Some dude becomes PM. Very nice, very nice. And I apologize for my coughing. I really do. Um, yeah. I, a lot of the time when you don't know, I'm actually sipping and drinking a lot of water and coffee off screen, or like actually on screen when I'm very quiet. So, a commitment to socialism. Socialism is the future of mankind, freed by the shackles of the bourgeoisie. The workers of all the world can and will unite and build a new perfect world. This is the key tenet of the socialist doctrine, our doctrine, and we'll make sure all know it. Radios, newspapers, and every cog in our propaganda machine will be geared towards praising the gospel of socialism and a commitment to its tenets. By adhering to the socialist doctrine and solely perfecting it towards communism, we shall pave the way for the nations of the world to follow on pervasive influences. As it has become a habit of his, Soslov could be found sitting at his desk into the night, deep into the night, my friends. Reflecting on his day and putting away his thoughts on a sheet of paper lightly, his subject of attention has been on past failings of communist comrades during the last days of Bukharin's old union, a time of factionalism. The cold-faced man had been wondering whom could be blamed for such discord incited failings. Mikhail Soslov had been going over names. Lazar Kaganovich. 
Of course, that old dude, Trotsky. Uh, Vyacheslav Molotov. All of them have personally involved themselves in a factionalism, though through backing a candidate for the post of General Secretary of the Old Union. Uh, backing themselves or instigated a conflict in dire period of history for the Union and its people. Trotsky had been part of the friction in the Union's early years after Lenin's death, having lusted to become General Secretary before ultimately losing to Bukharin, while Kaganovich and Molotov had been loyal lapdogs of the Stalin in his own quest for the Soviet throne. Though Soslav would have dismissed his name from the list if not for being an influenceable member of the party, susceptible to outside influences and merely those that his wife were sympathetic to. A slow realization came to Bushin in his mind as the man continued to write, words flowing from the tip of his fingers. Even our party today is united and undivisible. It's foolish to say that that has always been this case. It's come to my attention that the actions of past members such as Kaganovich, Trotsky, and Molotov might have been due to outside influences contrary to Lenin's ideals. One would describe them as akin to cosmo cosmopolitan bankers, showing themselves to be prisoners of bourgeois Zionist ideology, a characteristic shared by the ruthless cosmopolitites abroad. As evident by the subversive anti-Soviet behavior of Kaganovich, Trotsky, and Molotov, ties to Zionist elements betrays a tendency to be held to be beheld to capitalist foreign associations. Anti-Semitism is a socialism of fools. Well, says that person, maybe it's all true. Maybe it's all there. Or maybe not. But maybe it is. <clears throat> Who's to say? All I know is I like big boys. Hmm. Hmm. Guys, we gotta get ready for arms. And united, or unity in ideology. And then we'll, then we'll revive the uh, economy. And we'll see what happens. Honor the peasants. Um, that doesn't really sound like we do very much here. Improving society too much, but whatever. United, or, keep saying united, unity, unity and ideology. In the old times, people were kept together by obedience to the crown of uh, brute force. In our Latin nation, instead, people were willingly band together by sharing the same ideology. No nation could stand the test of time if its citizens quarrel on all matters of government. In division lie the seeds of autocracy. In order to enact democratic essentialism with full efficiency, we shall adapt our ideology to the modern times, removing all obsolete or controversial ideas and purifying it with our own zeal. The result will be our party line, become our party line, that we shall carry all the way to Moscow. We're carrying a lot of things all the way to Moscow, you can't tell, so... Uh, grab some of that. We're going to need some better planes. We're going to need a lot more factories. Jerusalem. Many people remarked that a German arrived or served as a general in the military of a Russian state so close to Muscovy, especially a communist one. People who spoke to Fritz Schmenkel at length, however, did not remain surprised for long. A deserter from the Wehrmacht, he despised the Nazis with every fiber of his being. Had ever since they murdered his father when Fritz was just 16 years old. Had ever since they had imprisoned him for daring to think differently. And had ever since they had killed the partisans he had deserted to join after years of fighting and forced him to flee deep into Russia. As German grew rusty these days, for when he spoke it, people looked at him with a mixture of fear, suspicion, and disgust. He cannot blame them, not a single one of them. Every Nazi he had killed, every part of Russia he up bringing to the Soviet fold once more, scarcely compared to the countless sins committed by his people. Schmenkel wondered if he could go to heaven, as the Christians claimed people did, and when he died. If not, at the very least, he would make sure a mountain of dead Nazis awaited him in fear at the deepest pit of heck. Peace is impossible until justice is obtained. Pretty much. Pretty much, man. Pretty much. Oh. Keep improving your, our industry. Because where we're going... Ooh, purging from corruption. New hires. New economic players have been hired in a recent initiative to decrease the efficiency of our economic models, replacing the comparatively sluggish and time-consuming predecessors. They're already hard at work, diligently serving production efficiency of factors across our territories, as well as gathering uh, statistics on raw outputs of various resources and materials. The co-workers look on with them with a vile suspicion, skeptical of their origins and presence in the factories. While they hammer away at metals or bolts uh, together engines and arms, the new surveyors watch over them with an objectifying gaze. An anonymity has arisen in many workplaces, one worthy of causing dispute if not reconciled soon enough. Understood. Good. Just what we needed. A commitment to socialism. A civilian recently escaped from the frontiers of the fascist collaborator regime of Samara was invited to talk on a daytime radio broadcast, being interviewed for the entirety of our territories and beyond to listen to. As they settled in and whispered into the microphones, the host greeted them and asked them about their journey northward, to which they responded with horrific stories of the freezing cold and the escape from bandits and murders. Eventually, the host came to the topic of the socialist cause in Russia and what it meant to be the, to the guest. He remained silent for a moment, thinking about the question, before answering with bold and proud statements of admiration, confessing that even after living under brutal fascist indoctrination, we remain true to the teachings of Marx and Lenin. Furthermore, he detailed that many in Samara believed similar things but were not so fortunate to escape from the grips of the fascist bandit regime. As the interview concluded, the radio host thanked his guests and asked if he had any final words for the people living in Western Russia. He cleared his throat and replied in a simid voice, urging the people to remain vigilant to the red torch of socialism, even when living in the most vile and brutal conditions as a liberating march of the Red Army will rescue them soon as he rescued him. Emphasizing this message, the host thanked the guest again before finishing his interview and returned to the normal broadcast schedule expected by his audience. Understood, and the revolution renewed. 
Now, after our long struggles, truly socialist government has been restored, and we begin marching once again towards the rising sun. Despite our difficult times, we have restored the people's faith in Lenin's heirs, and our party stands united by the Secretary's general side. Lenin said something beautiful in motion more than 50 years ago. Now, it falls upon us to continue his legacy. The revolutionary spirit hasn't been crushed by the German panzers, and neither has it been blown apart by the Luftwaffe. Now we renew our vows to the permanent revolution to see its flames burn bright. Workers of the world, forward. Nice. Keep boosting up, babies. We don't have enough debt yet. And honestly, I think if I remember correctly, every single time that we have Omsk reunify Russia... Actually, let's get some better arty. You know what? No, screw it. Get some better planes. Better planes up, yeah. Every time they reunify Russia, they always attack these guys, so that's why I put our guys on the line here. And so with these guys, we have these divisions, but I did throw some tanks on them already. Oh, no, maybe not. Oh, recon tanks, recon tanks. How many tanks do we have? 82 is not very much. Crap. <laughs> Motorized. Um, how many APCs? We actually have some APCs. Let's go with APCs here. Uh, let's go four. Let's go main battle tanks, because we're going to start using those a lot more. And now we're out like 400. Oh, only 77. That's not bad, actually. That's a lot better than I thought it would be. Uh, we can go down not by any. Can't go down by any. Yeah, the next stage will do bit better. The error of your ways. Welcome, comrade Ignatiev. Have a seat. The bureaucrat seated himself in the uncomfortable steel chair before Mikhail Soslav. The general secretary continued with the task of hand writing a letter behind his desk. <clears throat> do you know why you're here, comrade Ignatiev? Soslav did not look up from his writing. No, General Secretary. The response took seconds, but the unnaturally long pause felt far longer. Comrade General, your writings have caused me grave concern, Comrade Ignatiev. I am concerned that your ideas you espouse in them are undesirable and contrary to the principles of the revolution. I expect this to be re remedied immediately. <clears throat> you are delicate to the Supreme Soviet, and you will behave as one. Malcontents will not be tolerated by the party, the new Soviet Union, or myself. You have clearly made a simple mistake, and you are re-familiarize re yourself with the principles of Lenin. Is that clear? Understood, but revive the economy. After 20 years of civil strife and German bombings, the once powerful Soviet industrial machine has long been since relieved of its mortal worries. Abandoned factories litter what few cities can sell proud themselves of such a name. Their roofs collapse under the bomber of duty and neglect. Their machinery is broken beyond repair. <clears throat> our infrastructure, too, has been reduced to ashes, with roads, bridges, and railroads interrupted by the craters or floods, and our agricultural sector barely manages to defeat our populace. Famine is a common issue for a beleaguered nation, and nothing will change if we can't at least keep our men and women from starving to death. Still, from difficulties come opportunities. With the German bombings gone, we have the chance for the first time since the beginning of this nightmare to better our condition. Plans will be drafted, so resources will be stored, and a new age of Soviet or socialist industrialization will begin for the new Soviet Union by the hammer and, of course, the sickle. <coughs> oh, that's not bad. Ah, we got all this stuff back. Nice. 700 political power. Awesome. Foreign instructors, poverty relief. Um, do that one, do that one, do that one, do that one. Yes. Okay, just do them all. Yay. Feeling pretty good about that. Hunt down the opposition. You know, since we're going to do that anyways. We've done enough. Which is stupid that we have to do so we can get rid of that thing, but whatever. Oh, yes. Extra influence. Yes, please. Give them a day. Let's be 69 for that. If you want to about that, please go ahead. Because now we're just going to increase our investment as much as possible. A new theater. Awesome. And then we're just going to be here and just increase the investment as much as possible. Medium investment. Nice. And I think that's the max we can do right now. So we have high investments, which is fine with us. Does that hurt our political power at all? I don't think it does. Um, revive the economy, what we're doing. No, I'm not seeing too much there. I don't think so. I want to do this stuff first because it gives us a direct benefit immediately. So the Soviet education system. One of the greatest changes the Soviet Union brought was free basic public education for all under the Tsars. Peasants weren't allowed to study in order to keep them forever under their noble thumb. With education comes innovation, and with in innovation comes power. Sadly, 20 years of civil strife and German bombings have destroyed the old education system in both a physical and metaphorical sense. With schools raised to the ground and children forced to work to feed themselves and their families, learning has become a secondary, even tertiary concern. We shall no longer tolerate such injustice. Our children need to learn so that they may improve both themselves and Mother Russia. Oh, we shall rebuild old schools to teach a new generation of young boys and girls this value of culture, and through it, how to be an outstanding Soviet citizen. Awesome. Anything else here? Oh, this one, yeah. Workers organizations? Yeah, that'd be fine to do. Actually, how does that hurt our money? Eh, it doesn't help out that much, but room for improvement. Comrade Pesha tugged at his collar. Darn, it was hot in the room. He dabbed at his sweat-glazed glazed forehead with a handkerchief. He carelessly sat a cast of papers down onto his desk. It was no use. He needed a drink before he'd make any progress tonight. Uh, 
out of it, pushed back his chair, and made his way for the kitchen. It was a long journey from one side of the apartment to the other, but it felt liberating just to be away from the desk. The downside was, however, he'd have to walk past him. The portrait of Mikhail Soslov watched as he made his way to his cabinet, and retrieved his drink of choice. Slacking on the jaw, the portrait asked, I should expect nothing less from you, comrade Pelish. Out of it shook the thought from his head. It was going to be all right, even if the reports were less than stellar. It wasn't darning, it just meant there was room for improvement, and comrade Soslov ate a pock of improvement. Especially if it adheres to orthodox methods, Beth of both worlds, he would say. Out of it toppled back to his desk, the paper strewn across his desk, hanging... Uh, from the walls, dripping out from the clouds above, he inhaled reports and exhaled them back out. He plopped onto his chair, put on his glasses, and read the bold text at the top of the document. A critical industrial failure in Samara. We'll expand vocational schools. Vocational schools teach young students with clear ideas about the future all about a single craft. While entrenched intellectuals consider themselves somewhat inferior to traditional universities, we are not as blind as them. From the classes come uh, the next generations of artisans, engineers, farmers, and bureaucrats, professions upon which lay the very foundation of a country. We shall increase foundings to vocational schools and give these brave boys and girls the best possible education with it. We will be able to excel, and through it, they will elevate the Soviet Union to new heights of innovation and power. We all serve the nation, and we all deserve the best for it. Goodbye, Slovakia. Coffee. I love coffee, man, so much. 16 and 50. There we go. Because we want to pop with these guys, too, so. Ah, Soviet education. Nothing like it. The road to recovery, my friends. I do apologize once again for all the coughing I did earlier. And even my cracking in my voice. Oh, terrible, I know. An ideological education. The tradition... Traditional teaching methods and subjects are fine for elementary schools. Superior education, however, especially universities, needs to adapt to the new times or we risk stagnation. <clears throat> By introducing new study courses and experimental curricula, we can revolutionize our education and help our students find what they excel at. Revolutionary minds produce revolutionary ideas, and the Soviet Union is a very embodiment of the concept of revolution. An innovative union. Gone are the days of decadence and backwardness. Gone are the fields tended by farmers and the factories where workers toiled with absolute farmers. Or obsolete farmers. Gone are childlike workers and or child workers in an empty classroom. This is a new rush, a new union where progress for both the nation and the people is reign supreme. We've done so much, but we still have much more to do. The past is no longer stalking us, and now we're the ones chasing the future. New investments in science and education will send us barreling into the new era of progress. Absolutely. Uh, let's keep making better equipment here, probably. That'd probably be a good idea. Training. And this, my dear students, is a laugh. Or a laugh. Roman was a... In his first class in a recently opened professional technical school, he was born in Pl Plusix, uh, in a poor peasant family. When the Roman Roman or Roman was seven, he went to the local school and showed his talent for technical sciences, mostly math and basics of physics. Out of almost a hundred applicants, Roman was the first one of the first. A technical school for him was a chance to prove himself to help his family and his country. Most of you don't know how it works or about its place in a factory, but that's the reason why you come here, right? So let's start with the basics. Roman's hand got tired after writing all the functions of a lathe, main element of it, and more and more to his notebook. That machine looked like something out of this world, a centerpiece of a song of steel and fire. And their teacher said that a factory in plastic has dozens of machines just like that. Roman was listening to every word of the lecture, trying to write down every small detail. He already planned a future for himself, a future proud worker, the backbone of a country, and the man who could feed his family. Enthusiasm is a great, tremendous thing, my friend. Ah, there we go, see? The invasion of the Southern Euros. Uh, I knew they'd do this, so give us some time. If you want to read about that, please go right ahead. But we're just going to straight up invade. Because, it, first of all, it uh, allows these guys to focus more on these guys and take these divisions away a little bit, so. And gives our guys a little bit more time to get more organization back if they need it. Honestly, they don't really need it too much, so. Strike them directly? Yeah. Make sure that you guys do this too. Standing by, there you go. We'll do what we can. And I don't think we have any extra plans. Yeah, we don't have extra plans. Okay. It's a Stadt Niederlande. I knew this would happen, so I'm not surprised at all. So. Once you play enough Russian reunifiers, you kind of get an idea what's going to happen. 7,000, not bad. We already lost 3,000, though. 8,000, not bad. Oh, Yezov. What a dude. Oh, 23,000 map is not much. Anything else here? Launch military intervention? No, 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 no. We don't do that one yet. Well, we don't get the reunification of Russia, but since it's probably going to be glitched by the time we get there, it'll be okay. 
education for those closest. The students gathered together in the school library at the same spot on the back of every other school day. It was an own private little space away from the commotion of the classes to work on the greatest assignment yet, to study the ideas and explore the thoughts of the revolutionary father of Russia, Vladimir Lenin. For the young Clemento, it was a slog, a constant, endless slog of reading dozens of long, winding tomes going on and on about the roles of the vanguard party, the establishment of the proletariat's dictatorship, etc., etc. The most exhausting of all through was the man himself, from his birth in Simbersk to his life in St. Petersburg, to his many imprisonments and his advocation for continent-wide revolution in the First World War. At least the October Revolution was coming up soon in the studies, so we could read up a bit on a bit of action. There were the two reasons driving Clement to stay diligent in his studies and not slack off, the first being his friends. They were into communism far more than he was, and they were much more invested into this assignment. But they made Clement laugh. They goofed around with him, they played pranks on each other, but most of all, they made him feel whole. And when the school ended and he said his brief goodbyes to them till the next day, he'd only have one thing on his mind. Indeed, the young teen cared little for the old Bolshevik, and yet he was the greatest reason he worked so hard in the studies. His family was one marred by strife from a father struck down by the Germans in the Western War to cousins and old family friends torn away during the conquest. In the end, he was left with only a drunken uncle, traumatized by loss. He returned only to find a sobering mess on the couch, who immensely, immediately embraced him once he stepped inside. His uncle turned to the ideas of Lenin when all else was lost to him. All else but Clement. When his uncle learned that he was now studying the man himself, his joy at the news was the first time Clement could remember him truly being happy, and he knew he couldn't disappoint his family, his only family. For you, uncle, I will excel. Followed up with, and part of the gospel. The gospel plan was founded by Bukharin as the economic planning board of the old Soviet Union. In the end, it wasn't used much due to the preference for light industry, and the results became evident during the war. Uh, while the agency has less, way less resources than her motherland, at the height of her power, we'll use our resources in a much more considerate manner. We'll immediately send enough personnel and funds to the agency so that it may begin drafting long-term plans for the economy and devise short-term solutions for the issues currently plaguing our country. Our plans will reach much further than what we can achieve now, and we'll be prepared for anything that may come at us. Yeah, don't worry about doing that, guys. Go where you need to go, do what you need to do, and win the war. Oh, well, there goes Iberia. Oh, boy. Um, intervention. We can launch an intervention later on. That's fine. Oh, what do we have in half here? That's just all this stuff. That's fine. Whatever. Chelyabinsk, which I just only play as Magnitogorsk, or how you pronounce that, maybe? Nice. Good. Do we have your superior? Oh, yes, we do. Nice. Do that even harder. Do it harder. We like it harder. God, I love Tino too much, probably. Yeah. You can't turn No, the front lights are something to hope for. Please change. <gasps> nice. God dang it, I just said this did not do that. Well, they're up to 20 divisions max now. If you want help, you can save us a couple losses, man. To Russia's brightest young minds, uh, the university building was new and gleaming, and its administrators could not have been prouder of their contribution to the resurrection of the country's academic life. The news of the renew renewed renowned chemist Nikolai Semenyov was interested in speaking to the students there met with a flurry of activity, furious arrangements of venue and seating. It had been hard, but now that the day had become clear that their efforts had been paid off swimmingly, the lecture hall was practically overflowing the students brought there both by interest and a hefty promotional change by the government, always interested in showcasing its scientific progress. The room was buzzing with excitement and potential as Semenyov took the stage. First of all, I'd like to thank you all for coming here. Even your presence shows how far we have come as a people. My generation has hardships of its own, but for you, who never knew a Russia that was not at war, to achieve so much with all that was against you is truly remarkable. Your generation, the chemists and engineers, writers and artists, scientists and scholars in so many other fields, will be the ones who bring the Soviet people back under the world stage with aplomb. My generation was unable to keep this union together. Yours will make it the pride of the entire world so long as you keep working and striving to be better than the day before. Semenyov went on for slightly under an hour, constantly having to ask the audience to restrain their applause. The air of hope and optimism in the room was palpable, and everyone, as attendee and planner alike, could agree that it had become a roaring success. The youth really are something special. Well, until we have to deal with them as a teacher, probably. Probably. Uh, towards the next phase. With our final goal being the establishment of a true communist regime, we need to set the first stones in our economy just as we're doing in politics. The state must oversee the entire economy, planning with precision and care the future needs of the country and the people, and ensure that production exceed, never exceeds demand or vice versa. By carefully balancing our resources for maximum industrial growth and planning for the long term in case anything happens, we'll kickstart both our economy and advance towards true communism. The Soviet Union advances. When do we uh, add the Euro League to the sphere? Our sphere. Who is in. Is it Goring? It is a fat man. Okay. Well, the bald man. 
for the fat man. Nice. Wow, they actually encircle somebody. Oh, that's kind of impressive. All right. Keep producing. God dang it, we just did this. That's a lot of casualties. That's nice. We suffered only 27,000, so this has honestly been pretty good for us. <laughs> uh, the gospel and the many shades of the left. Or of left. The socialist economy is the only one that can claim to be both moral and effective and be so in practice. Uh, Ovid's appeal shall use a sweaty hand to adjust the microphone on the podium. He knew the economy. He at least could say that much. His job was to analyze the market and mold it to the workers' best interest. What Ovid's enjoyed more than putting his knowledge into the practice was sharing it with just about anyone who would listen. Speaking of the sick of car academy of state service and administration, Comrade Pelish fell into a stride near immediately, speaking at length about the superiority of the social system employed by the Comrade Suslov. What the economists didn't account for was something or someone to talk back, such as natural living day to day as with yes men. Comrade Pelish asked one of their pupils, should we not adhere to the foundation laid down by Comrade Bukharin? I understand his shortcomings were plenty, but at the same time he led the charge to revitalize Siberia. A project, as we can see from what little news trickles in from the east, has bare fruit. Albert sat in his grip on the podium, his knuckles turning white. I will capitulate to you on that point. Comrade Bukharin made a great strides in breathing life into the dead east. However, I should not have to remind you that we are where we are now, and how we ended up not in the Soviet Union of old, but this new one is simply a matter of sustainability, long-term versus short-term. The social struggle cannot end at Siberia or pr Russia proper. It must continue on, not remain stagnant. We must, thusly, take plans, lessons from the Siberian plan. A five-year plan, not bad. That's really not bad. Take inspiration from Bukharin's civilian-focused development. Wait, so, uh, production efficiency retention, infrastructure construction speed plus 25%, civilian factory construction speed plus 50%, and we get 10% here, but then you get 50% for military construction. Honestly, this is probably what I prefer, but we're going to go with this one. Yeah, we're, we're not the same Soviet Union. We're a different Soviet Union. Um, uh, so thank you for we don't really need that. Honor the peasants. Um, industrial ex equipment society does go up a little more. Uh, oversee the planning. The Goss plan has started working, and the resulting plans are satisfying to say the least. By further increasing their funds and personnel, we'll have to have both a tighter control over the economy and more experts dedicated to the betterment of the Soviet people. As our economy starts recovering, it's fundamental that we remain steady and do not fall prey to excesses. Even growing too much can be a detrimental in the long run, and we must make sure that we do everything flawlessly. If you want about this, please go ahead. And this one, too. Nice. And the Gulag's captured. Uh, oh, my finger slipped. Oh, 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 oh well. Integrate them. Or in barrack, huh? Just in case. And now we're not going to have any room for... Oh, they're in with, with us. But they might still reject us. We need to integrate these places, so we might as well. Even though we won't be able to improve our society too much with that now. But whatever. And there goes the manpower after we make a few more divisions. Nice. But we should have quite a few more abilities to work with now. Well, especially after we core everything. My goodness, we need so much already. Do, are we out of, we're out of guns, too. No, no, no. We have 2200. That's not much, either. You know what we're else out of? Coffee. Oh boy. Expand central production nodes. Right now our industries are located primarily around a few cities, with the capital being the most prominent. However, we need much more if we're going to set our plans turn into reality. Gorky and the other industrial nodes must be first be brought back into functioning order by repairing damage or obsolete infrastructure, and bringing in modern machinery from wherever we can fetch it. Once the preliminary work is done, we can start expanding them, interconnecting the region with the modern railroads and building more industries that will in turn give us give work to the masses of impoverished work farmers coming from the countryside. Slowly but surely, uh, we'll increase our production capabilities until we're poised to begin with the real economic struggle. Hey, if you wonder about that, please go ahead. They'll know what's best for them. Control and communication in the animal and the machine. You see, General Secretary, our efforts have finally culminated into something tangible, a window to the future, if you will. The older party members seem enthusiastic, to say the least, as he led an impassive Suslov through what seemed to be a maze after a couple of minutes. The group of communists finally found themselves in a poorly lit room, the older man seemingly finding it difficult to find the light switch. Finally, after fumbling for what seemed like an eternity, lights were turned on and something instantly drawn to Mikhail's attention. Huge metal shelves closely knitted together, a layer of buttons running across a lot of them, electronics littering its facade. A true state of the art work. Technically, the first and only one of its kind here, pure Soviet design and conception. Its complex capabilities shall surely be a boon to our administrative matters, or mis administration matters, perhaps even a boon in other state matters. He was simply shyly scrutinizing Sussel's face, trying to see a hint of emotion that could betray the goal of society put up in front of others, yet the General Secretary stood there, cold face as ever, contemplating what this breakthrough meant for the party, its bureaucracy, and its, of course, its future. 
And so we lose uh, more political power, so we can do that stuff too, which is fine. Absolutely fine with, with us. Nice. Good, good, good. That's a lot of debt we're going to have. But that's all fine with us. It's all for the good cause. Overseeing the plague. As Vladimir, son of Nikolai, sat at his desk, a couple of small, a small cup of freshly brewed tea at his side, he wondered how it came to be here and now. His father died in Sevastopol, and his mother in the chaos of the West Russian War. His brother and nephews, too, about tuberculosis that had hit their village not three years prior. How was sitting at his desk, overlooking the same plans his fellows had already analyzed and scrutinized three or four times by now, was going to avenge any of them? If he was honest with himself, he didn't know, but he was a member of the Communist Party precisely for that reason. The higher ups knew what they were talking about, and if they wanted to do the plans checked thrice to ensure nothing with them, within them, threaten the revolution, that was exactly what Vladimir would do. An icy smile appeared on his face. Who knew, after all, perhaps he would live to see the German Germans humbled? Not all men are leaders, but that doesn't mean make them any less important. Under the peasants. One of the greatest mistakes of the Soviet Union was the excessive reliance on industrial cities. The people need to eat as much as they need in order to be, both be healthy and loyal, and in the larger scheme of things, a famine can be as much of a catastrophe as any military defeat. The farmers are a fundamental part of the country, any country, especially a socialist one. No one will ever be allowed to think them inferior to industrial workers or to the bourgeois, and anyone daring to take their contribution for granted will be punished. An army marches on his stomach, and this is valid for countries too. Uh, let's keep going on with better, better tanks, yeah. <laughs> 15 billion? Yeah, uh, whatever. Uh, we integrate these. No, we, I guess technically, yeah, we could go ahead and integrate and get to the next focus tree, but that would be an absolute waste right now. We don't get anything from that, like maybe except for stability. So, and we already have 95%, so it doesn't even matter. Yeah, all these divisions, I don't care. I, I don't. Don't bother me with this. Look at all the stuff they have. Do not care. Um, no. Nice. On to the peasants. Mechanize the coal hoses. The coal hoses are a collective farms organized by the states so they can achieve maximum production efficiency. Until now. With a limited means, this mainly meant that agricultural tools such as plows and scythes were shared between the farmers and that the workforce was a symbol following centralized plans. With a renewed focus on industrialization and economic growth, we shall finance a large agricultural mechanization plan for the coal hoses. Buying large stocks of farming machines such as tractors and threshing machines will bring our agricultural agricultural sector out of the age of the Tsars and into the modern age of socialism. Production will increase tenfold, and farmers will be much happier as they no longer have to break their backs on the fields. <coughs> ah, leader only accepts integration. Very good. On to the peasants. Uh, Talagat Gaziev wasn't a really important man. Oh, he'd risen in the rank of executive secretary of his primary party organization for sure, but that wasn't much of a claim to boast about when the said PPO only contained about 20 people. Less than a thousandth of the greater membership of the Communist, Communist Party and Komi. Yet he did his work well, trying to take satisfaction when, it, or, when orders from the party's higher ups came down. Right now, for instance, he'd been delegated to grant a series of awards to higher performing members of the peasantry, mostly for services to socialism and the like. Apparently, the party leadership was trying to emphasize their contributions to the survival of true communism or something. Talgat didn't really care, but he had a job to do. The people standing the uneven line to his side, facing the cameras were an odd bunch, a mix of young women and elderly men for the most part, many stony-faced and scarred by years of hard labor and service of what they believed in. A young boy as well, apparently he held single-handedly stopped a fire which nearly reached a grain silo. As Telgat handed the boy his medal, he gave him a slight pat on the shoulder and reassured him that the party was proud of what he'd done. The sight of the smiling boy with his burned, scarred face went to visit Talgat in his dreams that night. But when he awoke, he made sure to write a nod or note to the party higher-ups to put him on the fast track for promotion within the party, when he came of age anyway. For a greater cause, we give our strength, and so our children may lead better lives. Nice. And you're instantly going to become all 40 come with, I don't care. Led by... Oh, uh, not you. We're going to save that guy for, uh... Someone else. Something else. Nice. Um, uh, we're going to need way more rifles. Uh, if you want about better industrial expertise, please go right ahead. Lots of cast. Excellent. Excellente. Debt is but a number, like age is just a number, and jail is just a number, or just a room as well. Not a number. Oh. <clears throat> 
develop refining infrastructure. Oil refining is a complicated process that requires large investments. In the days of the old Soviet Union, the oil fields in the Caucasus covered our domestic needs, but we no longer have such a luxury. Fuel is a rare and precious resource to obtain, and often the only way to get some is to pay black market dealers or rely on pickle peace treaties between several warlords. A modern industrial society can't survive without such a fundamental resource, and as such, it is our duty to secure a stable and reliable source of liquid gold. By funding the construction of refineries across the nation, we'll make sure that our industries and mines have at least their basic needs satisfied until we can find some real oil. <clears throat> Increase resource production quotas. Our industrial sector is growing, which means our need for raw materials such as iron, coal, copper, wood, and many others is steadily increasing. With the mining sector already established, it will be difficult to find entirely new ore, ore veins yet untapped, and we can't simply rely on luck. To this end, we'll increase resource production quotas. <clears throat> By funding the acquisition of more modern machineries, improving mining crew training, and creating a new culture of stock hanovism, will maximize the output of our current mining facilities, reducing costs across the board. Socialism is the way forward. <clears throat> my apologies once again. Holy crap. Oh my goodness. My voice is just not doing well today. But there's nothing that I can really do about it. Until I cough. My bad. Oh, they're going to work feeling good. New industrial centers, of course. Our main cities have developed nicely ever since we began a reindustrialization plan. However, relying too much on a few large industrial nodes would make ourselves vulnerable. If 20 years of Luftwaffe bombings have taught us anything, diversifying production and spreading out our industry is the only way to keep going under duress. As an additional benefit, funding these expansions and conversion of large agricultural towns into proper industrial cities will offer work to even more un unemployed or poor people and spread the ideals of socialism to the farthest reaches of our domain. From today, we start building the Soviet Union of tomorrow. We're going to need them against some German boys. Uh, Russian unification, decreased trading, yeah. I'll give that one. Stupid Brittany. But towards the stable currency. While the final goal of socialism and communism is the eventual ab abolition of currency, to be replaced with a just system where everyone gives what he can give to the state and receives what he needs from the community. We all know that there's still a long way to go until we can even start thinking about this. As such, we need to keep currency, if only to trade with outside and not impoverish poor even more. The ruble of the Soviet Union has been kept as our official currency during these troubled times, but it's been devalued so much, it no longer has any meaningful value. If we want a stable economy, we need to act a comprehensive monetary reform to stabilize the currency and pick its value to fix indexes decided by the state. Nice. Interest rates at 7%. Oh, I hope so. At the cost of short-term GDP growth, huh? You know what? I'm totally okay with that. I'm 100% okay with that. Gold. The road to recovery. To say that the Soviet Union has endured difficulty or difficult times will be the Secretary General of Understatements. We have been subjected to 20 years of plundering, bombing, civil wars, famine, diseases, and every kind of disaster that could befall human civilization. If recovery was a road, it would be no long. It would be longer than the Trans-Siberian Railroad. With their efforts and faith in socialism. However, we have finally turned the tables, while it still takes years, and perhaps decades, to return to the true prosperity. We have achieved admirable results in requests for reconstruction. The people are no longer famished, and our industries are filled with hard-working crews proud of their whole role within society. One day, we'll restore the Soviet Union to what it was before. Just you wait. Nice, seven days left. Oh, since we're here anyways. Get rid of all the stuff. I don't care about this stuff. I uh, do not give a crap about this stuff. Nice. The road to recovery. And the Restore the Red Army will be next. The great story never told you, you only about that, please go ahead. Boom. But gold. Gold, how many blood will spell for a metal that was barely any use in anything that isn't jewelry or electronics? Arvid's Pelsch was sitting in his chair thinking about the measures that could strengthen the ruble. Main reason why monetary reform even started is to make the ruble viable for outside trade. And in order to do this, it should be as stable as it possibly can. Old Smith in economics books is a pet currency to our gold reserves, which are scarce, but it should be enough to stabilize the prices. Next up is to establish a fixed exchange rate, mainly to avoid possible machinations and prevent inflation that it may cause. It was near midnight, but there's something that didn't let Pelsch fall to sleep to fall asleep. Will those efforts to strengthen the ruble be worth it? In the end, money will lose all its value as the Soviet industry grows more organized and the more people will recognize money as what it is, a paper with ink on it. No, in 50 years well, or so, it will become a reality. He was sure about that. But right now, there's no means to ensure the safe transition to a moneyless society. But every step we take may make the day when it will become a real possibility closer and closer. We must do it. Restore the Red Army. 
Harvard Army, still a relatively new institution. Forming the chaos following the coup that brought socialist rule to Comey. Uh, the current military force is only intended to be just good enough to carry out defensive operations without collapsing in, in on itself due to a lack of organization. Fortunately, or unfortunately, good enough simply won't cut it. The enemies of socialism grow in strength all around us and already pose a greater threat than any foe we faced during the reunification wars. To better prepare ourselves for the inevitable wars of the future, the Red army must be restored to its former glory, a professional fighting force that resembles the very same army that once stood on the front lines against fascist tyranny many years ago. And I'll just do all this stuff. Nice. Also, we have some comments that I've not talked about yet, even though we're like 50 minutes in this video. Um, there we go, that's fine. Uh, we're getting a bit sus here. We're getting a bit sussy here, as some of you guys would say. Uh, Ivan Serov said in the comments, he does not approve of this. Well, it's a little too late. We're going full steam ahead, my friend. Full steam ahead. Uh, so says, can we do Selena? I think I played a Selena before. I could be wrong about that. I might have played Selena, maybe. Uh, someone says, hail the party, down with the revisionists, and... And TNO here, we should play as the U.S., which I played as a whole bunch of times. We should play as Spain, which I didn't do once. and Or play as France. Well, France has no unique focus street right now, so eventually. Wow, Iberia, you suck. Wow, that sucks to be you. But anyways, lessons from the Sith, good, good patriotic war. Uh, city foreign strategies. Uh, lessons from the unification wars. Tactical flexibility. Well, we're new and improved, so if you're about that one, please go ahead. As well as this one, too, but lessons from the unification wars. West Russia is united under the Red Banner once more, but the road to get to this point was bloody indeed. The wars to bring the region under control saw some of the bloodiest fighting since the Second Patriotic War. Despite the Red Army's victory, the constant warfare exposed some serious flaws that will need to be addressed before we continue the reunification. Each warlord of the Red Army crushed used different strategies and organized their forces in a unique fashion. We'll take into account all the forces we encounter and we'll see if we can incorporate their strengths into our own forces, whilst avoiding their weaknesses, of course. Improving society so much. So good. How's Poverty doing? Eh, it's getting there. Ooh! We're about to improve uh, agriculture permanently. Not bad. Hey, not bad. Academic base is pretty good too. Just build, 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 build. When you're done building, build some more. Could be by one. You save slightly some manpower, but not very much. And we'll do some APCs too. Tactical flexibility. It's often said that no plan survives first contact with the enemy, and this was no more apparent than in the unification wars. Despite having detailed strategies in place for dealing with their enemies, more often than not, unexpected developments would leave our command staff floundering and able to react in time. All the while, our units on the field suffered. Wow, their officers panicked trying to determine what to do next. These individual disasters could have been easily avoided had we implemented a more flexible system of unit tactics. More autonomy shall be given to the officers in the field, who will be trusted to improvise should the chain of command break down in the heart of heat of battle. Instead of relying upon orders from high command, officers shall instead count on their own initiative and the tactics utilized by individual units. Oh, well, maybe we should have done the other one, but whatever. 15 billion ain't too bad. <clears throat> and then a modernized force. Tactical flex mobility. And we can use that manpower too. A modernized force. Our efforts are paying off. The Red Army is beginning closely to resemble the very same force that crossed the AA line into fascist occupied territories nearly a decade ago. Finally, bearing the markings of, or makings of a professional military, however, the truth is that we have not gone far enough. Our current Red Army would have been, would have been considered top notch in decades past, but it's hardly up to modern standards. The General Secretary has approved a massive increase in funding for the Red Army, intended to aid with more intensive modernization efforts. No longer shall we lag behind the rest of the world. Through the application of cutting-edge modern technologies and intuitive new tactics, the Red Army shall transform into a modern force, ready to face the battlefield. Well, that's not bad. Revolutionary soldier. Oh, Bratia. Oh. I'll probably do this one. The Revolutionary soldier. At the end of the day, it is the rank and file who make up the beating heart of the Red Army. <clears throat> the soldiers of the Soviet Union were, at one time, legendary for both their devotion to the socialist cause and their unflinching tenacity of battle. Our own troops are certainly not lacking either of these aspects, and it would help to further encourage such professional ideals for the new recruits as well. The ideal, the ideal vision of a truly revolutionary soldier must be realized once again. We need able-bodied men and women who are willing to undertake any sacrifice necessary for the motherland, soldiers who would make the Red Army worthy of proclaiming themselves as the strongest. Are we still building quite well? Yes, yes, yes. Trade-wise, are we doing okay? We could use a spot of rubber, which we'll, we're willing to trade for right now. <clears throat> because Far East versus Central Siberian Republic. I'm going to assume that CSR is going to win, but you never know. <clears throat> Very good. How much people do we get every day? Two, wow. If you want a better, uh, better industrial equipment, please go ahead. Onwards. 
Good, good, good. A revolutionary soldier. Atvamat. Kalashnikova. Kalashnikova. Kazakh military stuff. Doctrinal refinement. Organized military. New Northern Fleet. Eh, seems enough. Okay. Return to the world stage. The necessity of inter service operations. <clears throat> Should we put our tactical efforts towards the Red Army, or do we aid some of the other services? It's an interesting question on one hand. We do have to do something about the Germans' air superiority. An air force would give us certain advantages over other warlords, and a submarine fleet might be able to do fun things with German shipping. But is it worth it? The air force will never be as good as a German one, neither will it be the navy, with a limited industrial potential, and a navy wouldn't be that useful in the wars we have, either. And the efforts we should put, uh, could put make, could make our army just a bit better. What should we do? Look so historically? Let's branch out a bit. Um, that's only one bonus. Yeah, it's probably better to do the land doctrine. But then again, yeah. yeah oh, we'll just do that one. That's fine. Which you need to complete some more, but. Uh, the Kazakh Military Academy. Uh, Kazakh. Uh, Kazan is home to one of the nine Surabov schools that were created during the Bukharan era. These specialized boarding schools were intended to provide young men with a secondary military focus education, and as such, many of the Red Army's officers started their uh, careers in these schools. Ever since the unfortunate collapse of the Soviet Union, however, the schools in Kazan has mostly gone unused. We shall renovate the bu buildings and reopen a new institution in its place, the Kazan Military Academy. Rather than being intended for secondary education, this new academy will be created with the express purpose of training new officers for the Red Army. Once Kazan's academy has been re-established, we can begin creating the next generation of the Red Army's officer corps. If you want about this one, please go ahead. Nice. Awesome, 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 awesome. Still building? Good. Hey, 8.1 versus 7%. I love that a lot. Uh, doctrinal refinement, why not? The needs of a modern battlefield change in the blink of an eye, and if one is not careful, they can find themselves failing or falling behind the curve sooner than they think. Despite our best efforts, however, the doctrines in use by the Red Army are so hopelessly trapped in the past. If action is not taken soon, our enemies would surely run circles around us. The time has come to analyze our strategies and refine them to be more suitable for contemporary conflict. Not only must we bring the Red Army up to the modern standards, but we must also keep up a sharp eye towards the doctrines of the future. After all, working to maintain a clear advantage over our potential foes is paramount to achieving victory. Oh, Africa's died. Goodbye, Africa. The horror, the horror. Well, at least we're not there. What are we missing still? Anything here? We're actually looking really good on artillery and stuff like that, so we need more planes, of course. We need more tanks. We need a lot more tanks, actually. And quite a few more APCs for where we're headed, so. Do five. Um, go down by ten. There you go. Heil who? A great conspiracy. Atvomat Kalashnikova. The AK-47 is a truly remarkable, remarkable battle rifle. Capable of firing rifle-sized cartridges at 600 rounds per minute, the Kalashnikov has also gained a legendary reputation for reliability. The rifle can survive a tremendous level of punishment, and is able to survive in even the hardiest of conditions without encountering any sort of problem. On top of all of this, it's easy to maintain and relatively simple to manufacture. It's said that you cannot improve per a, a perfection, but whoever coined that phrase has obviously never met a Russian weapons designer. We'll begin trials on a new standard battle rifle for the Red Army, deriving from the tried and tested design of the AK-47. In our time, our troops will hopefully get their hands on a weapon even more effective than the vaunted Kalashnikov. I love the Kalashnikov. That's such a good rifle. One of my favorites, man. Reorganize our war ministry. When the expansion of our territory comes in an unavoidable increase in the number of officers needed by the Red Army's general staff, this would not be too much of an issue if not for the fact that the war ministry is currently a chaotic mess, virtually unchanged from the days of the Komi Republic. This sorry state of affairs cannot be allowed to persist. The war ministry must be reorganized from the ground up to better serve the needs of a considerably larger area of operations. With some extensive of streamlining, it is believed that the chain of command will follow more smoothly. Generals will be able to receive any and all necessary information about combat readiness or battlefield conditions at a moment's notice, enhancing their abilities to command our troops. Nice. Very good, very good. Poverty, please get better. Oh, yeah, and also, as well as army professionalism, too. That'd be good. The new Northern Fleet. But standardizing the arsenal first. Atovama Kalashnikova. As an excellent weapon created during the turmoils of the 50s, it's easy to maintain and, most importantly, learn, but no weapon is perfect. The main drawback to the AKs of our army is that most of them were produced by a myriad of different workshops all around Western Russia, with a comparatively small amount of rifles produced in order and proper factories of Ivhensk and Zatelsk, which causes a lot of troubles with their maintainability. In order to change that, a new pattern of AK should be created, which would be standardized rifle for our army. Just a bit of polish needed. We were restricted to a landlocked status during the Komi Republic days. 
which meant that there was little practical need for an able force. The situation has changed dramatically, however. With access to the sea secured via the critical port of Arkhangelsk, the time has come to organize the beginnings of a new red fleet. While the port is frozen over during the winter, it is nonetheless the most important port west of the Urals that still remains in Russian hands. Our navy will be tasked with the protection of this port rather than large-scale naval actions against enemy fleets, as we do not have the capability nor need to build a large armada of ships, at least for now. Ah, uh, better APCs. Ooh, look at that lag. Oh boy. Oh boy. What's going on? Cool. And then the Red Air Force, of course, will do both these and will finish up this tree as well. The new Northern Fleet would be great. More naval XP and four research bonuses for ships. Admirals wanted, acquire within. <clears throat> nice. The Red Air Force. We still remember the dark months spent in the shadows of the fascist terror bombing campaigns. Our only source of salvation was the brave exploits of the free aviators, but even they could not be everywhere at once, with the situation in West Russia stabilized for a time being. We must learn to stand on our own two feet in case the Lufthansa returns to our skies. The use of aircraft is nothing new to us, but without a proper military wing of our own, the potential of our wings is needlessly limited. Therefore, an independent ar air arm of the military, the Red Air Force shall be created to aid the establishment of this new force. We shall expand more key air bases under our control to house even more aircraft and begin development of a modern aircraft to help dominate the skies. And of course, we will return to the world as well. The dark days of the Warlord era have finally come to an end, and a young nation has climbed out from the abyss to establish itself as a true regional power in the past. We've had little need for our foreign ministry, as diplomacy in the Warlord period usually involved the sword rather than the pen. The world beckons. We now find ourselves in need of capable diplomats more than ever. The foreign ministry must be expanded to meet the requirements of properly conducting international diplomacy, and they should begin making contact with the nations of the globe as soon as they are able. Let all the foreign powers know that socialism has returned to Russia in earnest. The West Siberian Provisional Authority gets change of authoritarian socialism. Uh, they're gone. Unfortunately, our area of Russia has been known for its strong naval traditions. This makes finding seamen for our new navy difficult, but moreover, it makes finding new officers and admirals next to impossible. We'll put a stop to that. Experienced fishermen, extra red navy men, promising recruits these will make a nucleus of a new officer corps. We will drill and have them read up upon Nelson, Mahan, and Yamamoto. We won't have the best officer corps in the world, and we'll have the best what we could with the circumstances. And that's all we can ask for. We may get the next Spiridolf if we're lucky. Require or restore international trade. The White Sea now lies open to us, and yet we still have no proper fleet to conduct international trade with. The very nature of the Arctic waters makes this task more difficult than it would seem. The port of Arkhangelsk is almost entirely frozen over during the winter months, and thus a merchant marine will require a specialized fleet of icebreakers to clear a path through to our trade partners. According to the Foreign Office, the nations of Scandinavia are already quite receptive to our authors of reestablishing trade. Due to their close proximity to our ports, they will be a relatively hassle-free journey for, for our merchant fleets as long as they're able to circumvent the frigid conditions of the North of the White Sea. Not North White, but White Sea. Nice. Yes. Yes, please. So we got plenty of uh, army XP. We need to go to four-year draft, which is... Uh, which we could go to four-year draft immediately. The Gateway to Europe. Oh, oh Margaret Thatcher. Oh, transport diplomacy. I'll give it to Europe first. Europe lies under a seal of wall fascism, but there are many ways to pierce this barrier if one knows where to look. In particular, our neighbors in Finland provide a convenient avenue for this purpose. Relations have not exactly been warm due to past tensions, but perhaps it's still possible to reach common ground. We'll send a message to the Finns with a few polite requests. Firstly, we'll ask for diplomatic recognition to further cement ourselves as a legitimate Russian government. Secondly, access to the ports will be requested. Although we have ports of our own, the fact remains that they are frozen over in the winter months and we have no access to the Baltic whatsoever. Land access to Finland's territories would solve this issue quite handily. Which they'll probably reject us, but whatever. We only killed them all off, that's all. That was our only goal. Oops. Nice. Very good. And this will take quite a few months to do anyway, so. We have put ourselves in quite a very jolly good position. Uh, I guess go up here and keep training. We're going to need a massive air force. And one more, one more, one more. Good. Approach free Norway. It would appear that the iron group that Nazi Germany has held over Europe is not nearly as tight as it seems. Norway, as was, was once ruled by an oppressive Nazi colonial government. Their freedom cruelly denied by the Germans in the quest for total domination over their neighbors. Miraculously, the situation has made a dramatic reversal. 
The Norwegians have finally thrown off their shackles and removed the Nazi regime from power, establishing an independent government in its place. They are now surrounded on nearly all sides by fascist influence and will, will need all help they can get. We shall send a delegation to Norway, free Norway, offering military assistance in exchange for recognizing our government as a legitimate successor to the USSR and the Swedish diplomatic mission. Sweden is one of the few European nations that has yet to fall under the sinister influence of Nazism, retaining its status as fully independent democracy. The neutrality during the Second World War may have been seen by some by as cowardice, but in the end it meant the complete preservation of their sovereignty. Diplomacy of the Swedes is paramount to our goals of establishing international relations, especially when one considers their proximity. A fully-fledged diplomatic delegation is to be sent to Stockholm, with the goal of requesting their diplomatic recognition. Should they accept, we'll be one step closer to establishing a government as a legitimate entity. Which I don't know if we can do the free, approach free Norway one, just because, uh, well, free Norway isn't necessarily free, probably under uh, German rule, but whatever. Yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, English Embassy. Uh, well. If you want to hear that one, please go ahead. Transpolar Diplomacy. To the untrained eye, the frozen wastes of the Arctic seem like nothing more than an insurmountable obstacle to any kind of fleet, the ice providing an inconvenience for the port of Arkhangelsk in the winter months. While this is not entirely false, the truth is that these frigid waters are among the only remaining gateways into West Russia still controlled by Russians. As such, it would be prudent to foster good relations with the various nations of the North. We shall extend an olive branch across the polar territories. Scandinavian countries such as Finland and Sweden are to receive requests for diplomatic recognition, while the very first overtures towards the nations of the OFN shall be sent to Iceland and Canada. No country is outside our reach, even if they lie beyond the treacherous waters of the Arctic. I'll prepare for war. Oh, yes. Because we still want to do all this stuff, too. Because get more factories, more manpower, stuff like that is still super, super good to do. Happy 1969, though, everybody. Nice. Hey, less than 13 billion is not bad. We're getting better and better at this. Oh, and debt went down. Wait, I thought it was supposed to be 7%, not 6%. Not bad. All the way with LBJ, huh? All the way. And we'll, of course, do the Red Air Force as well, but... It sucks that we can't do that one, too. Open the Rykov Conference. The Soviet Union was the once the bulwark of global socialist cause, sponsoring the comrades from around the world, no matter where they came from. Ever since the collapse, however, this mantle has gone, gone unclaimed for nearly two decades. With the socialist government restored to West Russia, we must regain the initiative. The idea has been floated of holding a conference in Rykov in the interest of fostering relations with socialist parties from across the globe and reaffirming our commitment to the international worker. Representatives from hundreds of work countries will be invited to attend and discuss how to proceed with advancing our mutual goals. This conference will hopefully reestablish our government as a preeminent socialist power and our friend to the workers of the world. Success with Sweden. Success. The Swedish government has accepted our overtures for cooperation and has officially recognized us, our government, as a legitimate successor to the Union and the rifle government of Russia. Already our diplomatic teams are preparing to establish an embassy in Sweden and our government has begun to reap the benefits of diplomatic recognition. Wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Give us a slight amount of time. I want to build up an Air Force right here. We have a radio That's fine. That'll be fine. Sitting by, you two are sitting by, you're doing that. There you go. Any extra cast, hopefully, yes. We go map ours, which sucks. Cool. Any other training here needed? Yes, yes. Nope, nope. Okay then. That's fine with us. And they'll get more manpower back too. Transpolar diplomacy. I, I know this is a very long video, but just because, I don't know. Sometimes at, at certain times of the recordings, like, I can make longer videos, sometimes I cannot, so. It is what it is. We have a lot of divisions though. It's very nice. <laughs> Acknowledge the Empire. We'll probably do that too, as well. In most ordinary circumstances, the organization of free nations would be our greatest adversary. The U.S. has long established itself as a vanguard of predatory capitalism, staunchly opposed to the socialist cause in every way imaginable. There are, however, not ordinary circumstances. These are not. The black tides of Hitlerism has washed over Europe, leaving only a path of death and destruction. Even the Soviet Union was not spared from the aggression of the fascists, and now our very heartland lies at their mercy. We need allies that will overcome this threat, and the OFN are the only international alliance who share this goal. A message shall be sent to the OFN in good faith, requesting their diplomatic recognition with luck. This agreement shall be the first step towards further cooperation, even if we are hesitant to work too closely with these capitalists. Social development, yay! And additional reserves, yay! Please, yay! Just go get everything, I don't care. Get it all. Because we need it. 12.35, not bad. Poverty, oh god yes, poverty relief, please, more poverty relief. 
We're at 106, which is not bad, but could be better for us. Rock off conference, acknowledge the empire, and we'll do the red for I'll probably do this one off screen because we probably don't have an event after that one, but propose a second turn? Yes. The Rykov Conference was a good first step to reestablish solidarity with the fellow socialists from around the world, but we can go even farther. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Communist International that had established had fallen into irrelevance, and eventually became defunct altogether. We must rekindle this flame and create a new entity for encouraging global cooperation. A new socialist international has been proposed, like the common turn that came before it. The second turn will set enable more economic, effective economic and political cooperation between all the socialist parties of the world. Even in these dark times, the second turn shall ensure that the revolution will prevail no matter what the trials lie ahead. Solidarity forever. Nice, the Certificate Conference, the Rykov Conference. Excellent news. The uh, Rykov Conference has been a splendid affair. The parties invited were cordial and honest, and its old entities were swept beneath the tide of global revolution. The minor disputes that occurred were quickly settled by the conference chairs, and on the whole, the meeting was both productive and enjoyable. If the conference is any indication, it appears that the ideological force of socialism will once again return to the global scene. Let the worldwide enemies of the proletariat and popular justice tremble before the awesome power of the allied socialist nations. The international ideal unites the human race. Nice. And we'll do Russian reunification as soon as we get through the entire book of Street Cell. And then we'll begin new. Which would be nice. Very, very nice. Mm, six, why? Well, this is four and a half. That's actually not bad. Hey, whoa, look at that. Oh, of course, we're not spending as much. Uh, I'm going to stop spending on the military, maybe? We're do be looking pretty okay on what we have for now. Obviously, it could be better. And we'll probably make some 40 combat with tanks. But... Still. Oh, you actually defeated Bulgaria. Wow. That is a little different than normal. Get some more tanks, yeah. Technology Empire and propose a second turn. And see if there's any event after that. Oh, is England not going to be able to win here? Robert M McIntyre. I used to say McIntyre, but it's McIntyre. My bad. Oh, yeah. They're gonna, they're, they, can, they, can lose. they can definitely lose here. Oh. Huh. That'd be kind of sad, not going to lie. Look at all the equipment we've got. This is beautiful. Especially with all the divisions we have. Oh, look at that map power. Oh, yes, please. Oh, oh, now they're going to each other. Oh, good. Obviously, we'll see who was going to do well there. Cross your Yeah, I guess you might as well. Who cares? We got enough command power for whatever we need it for. Look at all the overbuilding. Oh, actually, we can build more cities. But I do want to see if there's any event for the Socialist International. So, that'll be good. And we've got a lot of roads to build after this too, but that's all right. we got time. we got 300 factories. Most of them are majority of civilian factories, so we'll see. We might build a few millies too, but time will tell. Hey, 8.8, it's very nice. 11.89. Go for the second turn. And we'll do the Red Air Force as well. Finish it off. All right, if that's it, I think we'll probably end the episode here. Um, if there's no... Oh, Moscow Authority is looking pretty nice, though. Uh, there's nothing else here. Power workers, organizations, sure. Why not? But at the time of this recording, I think that's going to be it for us right now. But if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I will see you tomorrow when we'll take out and reunify all the rest, hopefully, of Russia. Thanks for watching. Have a great, great, Suslav, rest of your day.